Ukraine like a hot potato. <laughs> so, I mean, you, you can sense it. The, the messaging has changed around uh, Zelensky. He's not this untouchable hero anymore. Um, the, the, the reality of, of weapons being sent to Ukraine are, are tapering off. As a matter of fact, the, the billion, the nearly one billion that Biden approved uh, just the other day, uh, a, a good chunk of that is actually going to, uh, to harpoon missiles, which you said are not what the, what, what the Biden White House claims is going to be. So you may want to talk about, you actually did talk about that in, in the previous video, but you may want to bring that up again. And like 200 million, like 160 to 200 million of, uh, of that money is just going to something called training. You know, like a big chunk. And, and I looked at those figures and I was like, okay, uh, you, from their rhetoric to their practical actions, you can see that the, uh, the Biden White House is desperately just saying, you know what, just drop these guys, let Europe deal with them, and <laughs> let's just get out of this mess and, and figure out what the hell we do in the next five, six months before midterms uh, come around. I completely agree. I mean, I think there's been a sh I think that doubts have been growing uh, within the administration for some time. But I think the key event, the single event that brought it all together was the shock inflation increase in May and the, the subsequent rise in interest rates and the fall in the financial markets. I think that this has brought home to the to the administration, to people in the Democratic Party, to people in the permanent offices of the US government, that this is a disaster and that it needs to be ended fast. And if it isn't ended fast, it's going to trigger more and more economic damage. Let's just deal with the military thing, because I think it's important. I just want to talk about the Harpoon missiles. Now, there's been much talk about the Harpoon missiles. These were going to be advanced missiles, anti-ship missiles, which would be used to enable Ukraine to contest the Black Sea by defeating the Russian warships in the Black Sea. Game-changers. Um, Game-changing missiles. By the way, many people, Andrei Martiana, for example, would have a lot to say about this, dispute whether they would even achieve that effect. But anyway, that's, that, was, that was the line that was sent. Now, it turns out that these missiles are designed to be launched from ships. Then there's no launcher for these missiles, which is ground-based. So the United States has to create a launcher for these missiles, a ground-based launcher for these missiles. And the idea is that this must be truck-based. And the reason it has to be truck-based is because if it's in a fixed location, the Russians will quickly find out where it is and they'll destroy it. So you've got to put it on a truck. Now, the problem is that doing that, developing a whole truck-based system for a missile that's designed to be launched from warships, specifically from Arleigh Burke destroyers, is extremely difficult. I mean, it's, it can be done. But it takes time to do. So you've got to design this thing. You've then got to, and, and that is a you know fundamental redesign of the whole sh of the whole system. That takes time. Then you've got to build it. Then you've got to test it. If you test, if you cut down the testing, if you take, uh, if you make, uh, you take shortcuts with the design you could easily end up with a system that doesn't work properly. So this is all going to take a very long time. It's going to cost a lot of money. Then when you've done it, you've got to train the Ukrainians to use a system which doesn't yet exist, and that may will take further time as well. Now, I've been told informally that this whole process might take as long as a year. I mean, to do it properly would take even longer than that. Some suggested, you know, several years. But, you know, if you start doing, if you prioritise it, several months at least, you could probably get a working system of some kind ready by the end of this year. If you're going to get a system that you will be up to a certain point reliable, it would take about a year. If you're going to get a really good system together, it will take about five years. Well, these are 
impossible time frames for Ukraine. <laughs> They're not going to change anything. What it looks to me like, and I'm going to say it straightforwardly, is the Pentagon, again, using Ukraine to get itself funding to develop a ground-launched harpoon system, which it probably wants for its own reasons, most probably to, uh, look, to position in the various island chains in the Pacific in anticipation of the conflict with China. <laughs> That's what it really looks like to me. I mean, I'm being, maybe I'm being too cynical here, but I mean, this isn't going to happen anytime soon enough for Ukraine. That's the reality. Now, if you look at the rest of the arms package, as we said before, it's not really delivering weapon systems for Ukraine in anything remotely like the quantities that Ukraine needs. So 18 more uh, howitzers on top of the 108 that was provided before. There are reports that Russia has already destroyed more than 18 of those howitzers which were already de delivered. So, in fact, that isn't even going to replace those which have been already lost. 36,000 rounds of ammunition. The Russians launch 70,000 rounds of ammunition in Donbass every day, according to what the Ukrainians say. So this isn't going to change anything. And realistically, the arms packages are just dwindling away. The Pentagon has looked at the situation in Donbass. They realise Ukraine is losing. They realise that this is simply throwing valuable equipment into the battle where it can't where it's just been thrown away and they're quietly dialing down support for Ukraine. That's the way it looks to me. That's the reality of the situation as it appears to me. And this harpoon story, it turns out, really doesn't mean anything at all. Now, that's that's the one thing I wanted to say about that. Now, on every other front, we've now had those gratuitous comments by President Biden about Zelensky, about Zelensky not listening to Biden's wise and good advice before the war. Um, that's raking up an old story. Why remind people of it now? But now we've also had further comments from our old friends, the anonymous officials. And this is a tweet from uh, uh, Saleha Mosin, and she is the chief Washington correspondent of Bloomberg. And it's been widely uh, publicized in other parts of the um, US media. And this is the tweet. Some Biden officials, some Biden officials, which ones one wonders, privately express concern that rather than dissuade the Kremlin as intended, US sanctions have instead exacerbated inflation, worsened food insecurity, and punished ordinary Russians more than Putin and his allies. Well, we can dis disregard the concerns, the crocodile worries about ordinary Russians. If you look at the original sanctions, they were clearly intended to hurt ordinary Russians. But the key point there is some Biden officials are privately admitting that the sanctions have failed because they're creating worldwide inflation. They're creating an inflation crisis in the United States. They're forcing the Fed to increase interest rates, triggering a recession, which is going to hurt the United States itself. And of course, they've, that uh, inflation is partly caused by rising food prices, for which there really isn't any short or simple answer. Now, I'm going to make a guess. I think these officials that we're hearing from are people within the Democratic Party electoral machine. They're quite possibly Obama's people. Notice how quiet Obama has been. He's not coming out and supporting this policy on Ukraine at all. And I can't help but think also, and this is in tune with her public con comments, that it's Janet Yellen and the Treasury team who are looking at the situation in the economy and are becoming increasingly worried. And it seems to me that this combination of people is pretty powerful and is probably strong enough to trump the, the neocons in the State Department and the National Security Council. And ultimately, they hold enough sway to adjust policy 
in the way that we're going to increasingly see. Yeah, you also have the story with with regards, I think it was either the New York Times, the Washington Post that read it like a day or two ago saying that um, Biden actually told Blinken and Austin to not be so gung-ho to go after Russia as well, to, to tone it down and to, and to not want to destroy Russia. It's something along those lines. I'm yeah, paraphrasing. That's right. That's right. But the, yeah. the basic that's essence point, of actually. the story was that Biden wanted things to be more measured and calm and more diplomatic, but it was these Clintonite, the Blinkens, the Austins, you could say the Sullivans, these people, the, the Newland Blinken faction that was, you know, we have to destroy Russia. Yeah, of course, except, of course, that it completely contradicts Biden's own comments. I mean, remember that speech he made in Warsaw? You know, that he, this man, Putin, has to go. <laughs> the, the uh, I mean, uh, that, you know, the ruble has been reduced to rubble. Do you remember all of that? That was just, you know, way back well, in March. He was under the spell of Sullivan he, and Blinken. We absolutely. Say, right? Well, of course, of course, of course. I mean, you know, Sleepy Joe. I mean, you know, he's uh, he's only the president when all said and done. I mean, you know, what what does what can one expect of him? But you know, but the fact is, he's now telling everybody. Well, you know, all that I said way back in uh, March. But that's not our policy. <laughs> I mean, our policy is quite different. Of course, he wrote or. Of course, he didn't actually write, somebody wrote for him, that uh, uh, op-ed in the New York Times, that it was all about helping Ukraine to negotiate, to get into a better position with negotiations. And now, of course, we have the New York Times also telling us that he's telling uh, Blinken and Austin, well, dial it down, you know, it's not really what we wanted. And as for that speech in Warsaw, well, of course, that never happened. That's going to vanish into a memory hole somewhere. It it, it was never said. Uh, nobody must talk about it because it's a speech that, you know, obviously uh, was misreported in some way. I mean, that's the, I mean, I don't know what they're going to say. But anyway, but that that I, I mean, that that is actually an important point that, you know, we're now being told that Biden is telling Blinken and Austin, in effect, to dial down criticism and comments about Russia, which um, suggests some kind of an attempt to open up some kind of, or reopen some kind of discussion with Russia. And of course, we also hear that the administration is now going around telling American importers to start buying Russian goods, chemical fertilizer and all that kind of thing. And one, the Ukrainians can't help but see, the Zelensky people can't help but see all of this as proof that the US is quietly giving up on Ukraine, or at least giving up on them, because that's what it amounts to. Yep. And if they're giving up on Ukraine and Zelensky and they want out of that, that means that it's going to be Ursula Macron Schultz in the European Union that's going to be left holding the bag. Absolutely. What a disaster. What a disaster. But I mean, you know, this is this is the thing I this I mean, I mean, so predictable. I mean, you know, you follow the lead of whom? Of, 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 you know, of President Joe Biden. I mean, he's, he's the person who you're going to, you know, jump into line and follow. You're going to sacrifice your own interests your own economic interests, you're going to put your economy into crisis, you're going to take all these extraordinary rhetorical positions because he tells you to just a few months after, you know, he left Afghanistan. I mean, it's, it's, it's oh. incredible that they did this to themselves. It is incredible that they did this to themselves, but they yeah. did, and they did it with enthusiasm. I mean, Hysteria, they were enthusiasm, the, hate. His, his, absolutely. I mean, you know, they, I, I, I remember this extraordinary period in late February, March, and they were enjoying themselves. You know, they were doing this with, you know, delight. It was like a sense of relief that, you know, they were finally throwing off the uh, restraints and doing what they really have ha always hankered towards doing, which is come after the Russians in the way that they wanted to do. So, I mean, it's a disastrous result, but there, but there we are.
Yeah, they were happy that they were uh, sticking it to the Russians, and they showed how much hate they actually have for Russia and for the Russians. I mean, they, the, the masks are off, but really quick, uh, we haven't discussed the UK. What uh, Europe is going to left is going to be left holding the bag in this disaster. The U.S. wants out, and they just want to ditch this this uh, this this Ukraine problem now. At they as they see it, uh, what happens to the UK and to Boris Johnson? Because Boris Johnson and Liz Truss just the other day they sanctioned. Patriarch Kirill. I mean, they're, I they seem to be getting more hysterical as we yeah. as we go along. Well, indeed, and in fact, they are they because, of course, they're closer to Washington in some ways than every than the Europeans are. They're becoming increasingly frightened, and you're already starting to see um, um, talk about Ukraine betrayed. <laughs> That's the narrative that they're starting to come up with. I've been seeing articles like that appearing in the Daily Telegraph which is, you know, the, the newspaper in some ways that's closest to the Conservative Party, to the government. Uh, ben Wallace, the British Defence Secretary, is talking exactly the same way, that, you know, uh, people are leaving, you know, this gun still pointing at Ukraine's head. Um, you, you're starting to sense that they're becoming increasingly nervous and that they also feel that they've been put in a position where they're, you know, they're going to be left hanging out to dry. They can't criticise the US. I mean, that's the problem. I mean, a German politician or a French politician might be able to. In Britain, it'd be very, very dangerous for a British politician to do that at this particular point. So what they're doing, bizarrely, is they're blaming the Europeans. It's not the Americans who are losing faith in Ukraine, who are thinking of turning away from Ukraine. It's, um, it's the Europeans who are doing it. And the particular person they're going after is Macron. Is Macron is entirely to blame for this, this whole thing. He's undermined Western support for Ukraine. In fact, I'm going to say it straightforwardly, Germany is going to be a terrible loser from this affair. Britain is going to be almost as bad. Britain has completely wrecked its post-Brexit future by getting itself tied into this thing in Ukraine. And we, 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 you said in another program that we did that um, they chose Ukraine, the Europeans chose Ukraine as the mountain to die upon. The British, it's even worse than that. I mean, you know, they, they, they not only chose to die on this particular mountain, they, they, you know, they, they, they struggled, they, they, they did this in the most grotesque and ludicrous way.